One of the main staples of early Disneyland is this sense of classic nostalgia, showcasing a side of Americana that was considered old even back in the 1950s. Whether it was with something like the park's Main Street, a section styled after the turn-of-the-century town centers of Middle America, or an even older depiction, with the Wild West theming of Frontierland, Disneyland was heavily inspired by that kind of old-school American history, and actually showed quite a lot of it. Now, of course, any depictions people make of the past will typically seem horribly dated the further you get away from when they were made, as most history ends up aging like bread when it comes to social values or political correctness. But none so blatantly can be found in Disneyland's history than with a certain restaurant from the park's early days, Aunt Jemima's Kitchen. As one of the most retroactively controversial attractions the park has ever seen, the restaurant actually has a rather surprising history, both in and outside of the park which is made all the more interesting by the fact that most people, Disney included, actively seem to avoid talking about it at all, which is part of the reason why it's so obscure and misunderstood. So, my hope with this video is to find out why the restaurant existed in the first place, what it was doing at Disneyland, and why it eventually went away. But before we could even get to all that, we need to start back way earlier, with the very beginning of Aunt Jemima. And quick disclaimer, we are going back to the 1800s here, so obviously some offensive depictions are going to be shown. It's all important for context, but I'm just saying it up front so you all know. Alright, let's get into it. Aunt Jemima as a brand was first created back in 1889, when a man by the name of Chris Rutt, a former newspaper editor from Missouri, purchased a small flour mill with his business partner, Charles Underwood. Together, the two would eventually devise the recipe for a self-rising pancake mix. Later, they would end up marketing their mix using the character of Aunt Jemima, based on a song written by popular minstrel show performer, Billy Kersans. However, with Rutt's depiction of Aunt Jemima, the character was heavily based on the Mammy stereotype. Now, the origins of the Mammy as an archetype in American history, as well as the broader reality it represented of slavery and domestic servitude even post-emancipation, is a much bigger topic than I could hope to properly cover with a video like this. But the important thing to take away from it was that the depiction itself was inherently flawed and not actually based on the ugly reality of life for both the enslaved and emancipated blacks of the 19th century, as much as it was a whitewash of that history, meant to appeal to the average white American of that era. But we'll come back to that in a second. Surprisingly though, despite its branding, Rutt's Aunt Jemima pancake mix wasn't all that successful initially, largely due to his minuscule advertising budget and poor means of distribution. Eventually, though, the brand was purchased in 1890 by R.T. Davis of the R.T. Davis Milling Company, owner of one of the largest flour mills in Missouri at the time, and, more importantly, a man with experience in advertising. Under his control, Aunt Jemima as a product managed to grow exponentially popular throughout the late 18 and early 1900s, where Aunt Jemima, in her antiquated depiction of the loving household servant with a famous recipe, helped establish the pancake mix as a staple within American households. And similarly, the character itself also became famous, largely due to the numerous portrayals of her done by various women throughout its history, starting with Nancy Green, a former slave who first took on the role in 1893 and famously appeared at the World's Exposition in Chicago that same year, drawing in huge crowds and really elevating Aunt Jemima's products to the national stage. And when she later died in 1923, the role was taken over in the coming decades by people like Anna Robinson, Anna Short Harrington, and Edith Wilson, all of whom would frequently appear as the character in person, as well as on some of the newly emerging entertainment mediums of the time, like radio and television in Edith Wilson's case. 
Needless to say that by the 1950s, Aunt Jemima was a huge part of everyday life in America. In large part, due to the seemingly endless advertising budget of Quaker Oats, who acquired the brand back in 1926 and had further entrenched it into the country's cultural zeitgeist since then, through one of the most effective means of doing so, advertising. Next week, the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet will be brought to you by the Quaker Oats Company, makers of fine foods for the whole family. Now a word about one of the many fine Quaker products. How fast do your pancakes disappear? Around our house, it's plenty fast. And not just because I've got three man-sized pancake eaters. It's because I have two new ideas. New Aunt Jemima Deluxe Buttermilk Mix and this handy shaker. Here's a combination that'll turn out the best pancakes you've ever served. You'll pour the smoothest batter ever and bake the roundest, fluffiest pancakes you've ever made. And what better advertising opportunity could come along in the 50s than a theme park created by Walt Disney. We've already talked about how certain companies back then were more than eager to fund the park's various facilities in hopes of using them to further promote their own brands, with places like Kennel Land, for example. So Quaker Oats was just amongst the many of them to jump on that opportunity, now agreeing to fund a restaurant at the park. And as the park celebrated its opening day in the mid-1950s, Quaker's restaurant was nearing completion, eventually opening in late 1955, only a few months after the rest of the park did. Located in a small New Orleans-themed section of Frontierland, the restaurant offered a selection of pancakes, waffles, and breakfast platters themed after the land, with items like the Mark Twain Special and Davy Crockett's Delight. Initially, the menu was pretty sparse, really not deviating at all from the various pancake mix recipes, but I'm guessing that the simplicity of its menu was half the appeal in the first place. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that the food itself wasn't even the restaurant's biggest draw, considering the fact that Aunt Jemima herself could also be seen there. With this being Disneyland, they really played up the aspect of her as a character, who, in addition to serving food, would also take photos with guests, and even occasionally sing over on a nearby stage. Throughout the restaurant's run at the park, only one woman was ever officially recognized for the role, Aileen Lewis, who was later given a plaque from the Quaker Oats Company in 1960, declaring her as their favorite representative. However, you can find photos of what do appear to be other women playing the part as well, which may have something to do with the fact that Aileen Lewis apparently died in 1964, prompting them to find a replacement. But none of these other women were ever officially credited though, and unfortunately, their names seem to have been forgotten. There were also other people who played the role of Aunt Jemima at the park as well, just not at the restaurant. Like this woman, who can be seen briefly in ABC's opening day broadcast. Along with her, Another actress named Palmier Jackson made an appearance as the character at one of the park's pancake races, an annual event hosted by Quaker Oats to help promote the brand, where contestants would run, skillet in hand, through a set course in the park and flip the pancake they were holding every time they crossed a checkpoint. This was just one of the many promotional stunts staged by Quaker Oats to help get the Aunt Jemima brand on people's minds in part to promote their usual line of products, but now also a new endeavor as well, with a chain of restaurants. Based on the original one back at Disneyland, Quaker began opening restaurants known as Aunt Jemima's Kitchen all over the country throughout the late 1950s, in an attempt to get in on the growing trend of diner-style eateries that were beginning to spring up around the time. It's strange to think about now, but Aunt Jemima's Kitchen was actually one of the first to establish that sort of chain-operated breakfast restaurant in the U.S., even predating places like IHOP, which wouldn't be around as much until a few years later, and even Denny's, which was still being called Danny's at the time, and only serving coffee and donuts at a few small locations around Lakewood, California. Not anywhere near the kind of aggressive expansion that Quaker was putting into their own chain opening locations all the way from Gainesville, Florida to Hartford, Connecticut, and even one as far north as Toronto, Canada, 
resulting in them having about 20 different locations around North America by 1963. Meanwhile, back over at Disneyland, the original restaurant was seeing its own changes as well. First, with the replacement of its old name, going from Aunt Jemima's Pancake House into the new Aunt Jemima's Kitchen in 1962. Along with that, the restaurant itself was expanded, taking over the nearby Silver Banjo Barbecue and adding onto its menu with some more non-breakfast items, the same ones that were being served outside of the park as well. But make no mistake, breakfast foods were still a big staple there, so much so that they even rolled out one of the kitchen's most famous items around that same time, with Aunt Jemima's Party Pancakes. Look, it's Disneyland! And some wonderful new pancakes have been created in Disneyland's famous Aunt Jemima Kitchen. They're Aunt Jemima Party Pancakes. There's eggnog pancakes made with ready-to-serve eggnog. Strawberry Aunt Jemima pancakes made with strawberry milk. And chocolate Aunt Jemima pancakes made with chocolate milk. Let's make some. That's easy. Just substitute two and one half cups of chocolate milk for regular milk in the Aunt Jemima deluxe recipe. The recipes are on the Aunt Jemima packages. Your milkman has them too. Make all three kinds with Aunt Jemima pancake mix and the different flavored dairy drinks from your grocer or milkman. Try the Disneyland sensation, Aunt Jemima Party Pancakes. My, they're good. For the first 12 years of its operation, the restaurant was owned entirely by Quaker Oats. That was up until 1967, when Disney fully assumed control of the restaurant. Presumably, since the park was now financially sound enough on its own, that they didn't need to have outside companies running their own restaurants. Although Quaker did remain a minor sponsor up until 1970, possibly due to an older contract. But after that, it wasn't long before the place was renamed, now becoming the Riverbell Terrace, serving most of the same kinds of foods and hardly changing any of its decor. Obviously, the most noticeable change here was the removal of Aunt Jemima, both in printed form on its sign and menus, along with the real character that would walk around as well. Now, it's likely that the main reason Aunt Jemima was cut so suddenly was because Quakers still owned the rights to the character, and the continued using of it would have required some kind of licensing deal. But it's just as likely that another big reason behind her removal was because of the growing controversy starting to surround the brand. Even as early as the 1960s, public perception of Aunt Jemima as a character was beginning to shift quite a lot in America. Aided by stuff like the growing civil rights movement, discussions about the depiction of the character were becoming increasingly common, as more and more people were beginning to show their own distaste for it. As a matter of fact, the rise of such discussions was part of the reason that the Aunt Jemima's Kitchen chain was never able to expand beyond its initial locations. And by the time the late 1960s rolled around, many of their locations around the country had already been sold off or renamed, leaving the Aunt Jemima's Kitchen brand essentially defunct by the time the original at Disneyland was rethemed. But despite its failings in the realm of real-world eateries, Aunt Jemima survived through its production of pancake mixes, syrups, and other food items in the coming decades. However, the controversy surrounding the character never managed to die down, leading to the many changes you can see in the depiction of Aunt Jemima over the years, bringing us to where we are today, with Quaker Oats and its parent company PepsiCo officially announcing the removal of Aunt Jemima, both in name and image, from their products last year and the announcement of their rebrand in February of this year, where they'll soon be sold under the Pearl Milling Company name. And regardless of whatever your personal stance is on the change, I think it's always going to be important to remember history, both the good and the bad, but still not let that get in the way of a change. Because while I can usually understand concerns of history being erased, I don't quite think that's the case here. I mean, a rebrand and new logo doesn't just magically undo the company's entire past, and people will still remember it. 
despite the product's to generic appearance. And if you don't think so, just take a look at the original Aunt Jemima's Kitchen. Despite how many times the building has been rethemed, or as much as Disney wants to ignore the fact that it was ever there in the first place, we're still talking about it today, 50 years after it closed. And that's because real history typically runs a lot deeper than theme parks, advertising, or product logos. All that's just a reflection of it. And as long as you can always remember the history of something, it can never really go away. And Jemima Pancakes without her syrup is like the spring without the fall. There's only one thing worse in this universe. That's no Aunt Jemima's at all. Aunt Jemima's without Aunt Jemima syrup? Ridiculous. <laughs>